Can you see it? It is? Okay. Mm -hmm. We are recording. So here we are, guys. Episode two of Quick Blitz. I'm Sheena Quick with Quick Out the Blocks, and I'm joined by Vashti Hurt of Carolina Blitz. And guys, we have a superstar today. We have NASCAR's VP, <laughs> Diversion, I'm sorry, Diversity and Inclusion, Brandon Thompson. Thanks for coming on with us today. We know you've been a very, very busy man these last couple of weeks. I appreciate the invite. Glad to be here. And uh, don't 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 be too hard on me. I know it's been tough to get in, in touch uh, and, and try to get this synced up, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> well, Brandon, um, those are those of the guys or our listeners, I'm sorry, our viewers that do not know and are not familiar with you, do you mind sharing, you know, kind of like your journey? You have been involved in NASCAR for a very long time. Can you just kind of walk us through your journey all the way up to your appointment to VP? Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually, I uh, got my start in NASCAR doing an internship, which is just outside uh, Nashville, in a little town called Lebanon, Tennessee. So I'm a, a native of Nashville and uh, really just wanted to get back home and do my internships, uh, college credit and uh, being nosy on, on the counselor's desk. My mama would be, uh, would be disappointed, but um, was just kind of being nosy, saw that there was just uh, something about an internship down uh, in Nashville. And like I said, I'm trying to get back home for the summer. Uh, took the internship and long story short on that, I kind of just fell in love with it. The first time I heard the cars fire up, chills went all up and down my spine, hair stood up on the back of my neck and I was, I was in. And so, um, to be honest, I'm, 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 kind of, I'm kind of a, I guess, a contrarian a little bit, and I, it was something that not a lot of people were doing, and so it's kind of piqued my interest in the fact that they kind of, um, you know, set me apart. Give me, you know, everybody was seeking internships in football or basketball or you know, obviously different sport, um, other sports and entertainment venues. It, it just sort of seemed like something different. So uh, did that. That was the summer of 2003 and 2004. Uh, got hired, uh, was fortunate and blessed enough for that to turn into a full-time position in 05. Uh, and I've kind of written it out ever since. Moved to Charlotte, worked with uh, Rev Racing, uh, which is owned by Max Siegel, who's also the CEO of uh, USA Track and Field. Uh, did that for a couple of years and came back to NASCAR uh, in 2012 and have, and have been here ever since. Okay. And Vashta, I know that you've covered NASCAR a lot previously before you moved on to, you know, just completely dominating the college scene in the Carolinas. Um, I'm, I'm kind of new to the game. I didn't start covering NASCAR till 2016. And the very first thing that I covered for NASCAR was the diversity, the drive for diversity pit crew combine. So Vashti, can you talk about, you know, what your experience was at the time that you were covering? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I started off with the race in Winston. And what's that, what's the name of that track in Winston? Bo Bowman Gray, right? Bowman yes. Gray. So I, I really enjoyed that. And then I've covered several larger races. I actually covered Bubba Wallace's race when he um, ran uh, in Virginia and Wendell Scott's family was there. Uh, I think that was his first, was that his first win? It was not his first win, but it was the win where he ran the uh, throwback pace game to honor Wendell. Right, right. I was there and I covered that and it's and it's and it's interesting to see NASCAR have getting the attention in a different sector now than it did before and I always in covering it I always said well you know NASCAR is a spectator sport and they've always said this right yeah. and if you go to a race it's a different experience than watching it on the TV um unfortunately sure. for a lot of us as black people and I, I, other people of color, it might not have been perceived as the most welcoming environment. Um, and it seems to be, it seems like NASCAR now is taking a um, very, um, making a deliberate effort to make sure that it, it, that it is more inclusive. Can you talk about that, Brandon, and how it's kind of evolved into where it is now? Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you, you, pick the, you know how to pick them. Uh, Bowman Gray Stadium is a, is a crazy place. We encourage anybody to go. I think I think one of the most uh, unique things about there is that people don't realize it's on Winston Salem State campus. So yeah. you really have to stop racing like end of July so the football team can, you know, have a football field back. So, um, but uh, a, a good place to go and cheap. I think it's like $10 or $12 to get in. But uh, to your question about the uh, about the inclusion piece, look, I think this is it's been a journey, right? And, and I've been in the sport 17 years and um, 
these conversations aren't new, candidly. Um, but you know, it, things have to take take time sometimes. And, and right. I would love for this to happen sooner. But you know, a lot of factors that that go into that. Um, and, and so I think where we are today, you know, given that we you know banned the flag and all the steps that were taken, I think was a microcosm of obviously where we were in time and looking at greater society and seeing, you know. How every uh, how how the rest of the world literally was was reacting to this, and I, I you know I applaud our upper management and things like that for you know for for being open to that, and it, it was relatively easy uh, it, you know to be honest with you in terms of those conversations and some some of the things that we were having. Some of these conversations have been going on for a while, but you know ISC, which was our, our sister company, we actually brought uh, bought them and, and came in and made it, uh, brought them into the fold, and so now we do own. Racetracks before, you know, it's kind of like, well, we don't own the racetracks, yeah. stuff that we can do. But again, I applaud upper management for understanding and realizing that this moment in time was the time to act and to do that, especially now that we do own, you know, a, a good portion of the tracks. Um, and just to, again, to make sure that people are feeling welcome. NASCAR, it, it, it's a fun thing. You know, a lot of the things that we do in our things and things like that, tailgates and all of us, it, it's the same, you know, in, in some of that same culture. And so I'm excited to see. Um, you know how we how we're going to enjoy it and put our own spin on it. So, Brandon, um, one thing that you mentioned that that I don't think a lot of people know is that I get it. The timing of it seems like okay. Well, all these companies are putting out statements, and that's why NASCAR is going to go ahead and ban the flag, and that's why you know th th we have this this um this diversity diversity and inclusion role created. But I happen to know for a fact that this is something that you guys have had in the works for a while. I want to say the um, position that you have now, they, they talked about finding someone at the senior level in that position. I want to say maybe last fall or maybe even before that. So could you kind of just clue everybody in to, for those that think, oh, okay, well, NASCAR is just, you know, following suit. They're just doing what everybody else is doing. Can you kind of speak on that and, and how this has been an ongoing process? Yeah, for sure. So diversity and inclusion department as a name is new to your point but there's been a diversity affairs and or multicultural development department since like 2000 in nascar so oh wow um, we're not new to that space and again i think you know we, people will say well, it could have happened sooner it should have happened sooner i'm not you know that sure i, mean, I think again we would have all loved to have seen it happen but um we're here now, and so yeah, to your point, we're not new to this. These conversations about having people um, in this space has, has gone on. We've had some great champions for uh, diversity and inclusion, multicultural development, and all those things across the organization for some time. Steve O'Donnell, who's the chief race and development officer, uh, has you know has been on that. He's the one that hired me into NASCAR in 2005 full time. Jill Gregory, who we report up to now. Uh, in the role that I'm in is a huge champion for that. Um, I mean, and the list goes on and on. Ben Kennedy, who's, you know, a part of the Franz family, huge champion. And then you know, even up to, to, to our upper, upper management, um, our, our chairman and vice chairman, all that, if people are on board and have been for some time. And again, I think, you know, companies have to have to grow and learn. And again, I, I, I commend and tip our cap to those folks for understanding the moment in time that we were in and are in and, right. and look at what it did. Can you talk a little bit about, because people don't know a lot about Rev Racing. Uh, they may know some of the names who have come out of Rev Racing, Rev Racing like Kyle Larson um, and Bubba Wallace, but it's a really good program that not only puts drivers on the track, but also, you know, students or former athletes in the role of pit crew members. So if you'll just talk about that Rev Racing and and that diversity program that NASCAR has been ever since I started covering NASCAR in what 2012, and they were doing that back then. I, I um, that was my first uh, interview with Max. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so there's this. Uh, it, it's been around since 2009, actually. So I moved to Charlotte in 2000 at the very end of 2009. It had already been kind of up and running, and so it was this first uh, revolution racing was what it was called. Right. Uh, uh, in 2010 when we sort of opened and debuted as a team. And to your point, uh, Bubba Wallace, right out of the gate, uh, won his first race at uh, Greenville Pick. And so first race of the team, first time Bubba was in one of those, uh, one of those then called K&N, now ARCA, uh, Menard Series East cars, wins right out of the gate. So we kind of started with a bang, 
Phil Horton does a great job with the peer cool development program. Um, I think again, uh, based on the first time that you and I and Sheena actually met, um, was you know when you all were covering that piece. Um, but what we did, we sort of re uh, revamped and flipped that part of the program in terms of the peer cool development program, and really just started focusing and honing in on HBCUs and recruiting there. Uh, Brianna Dang a lot about uh, graduate of North State. She's got a teammate. Um, or a classmate actually that, that came out of that same class with her that's working at Richard Children's Race in Clark Atlanta has uh, Jordan Page, so I gotta shout that out. I'm a proud CAU alum. So um, a lot of folks kind of come through from a variety of HBCUs and uh, we're really proud of that. Some big, uh, some um, larger institutions as well. We've got people from University of Kansas, University of Miami, but Bill Cookman again is in there for another HBCU. So we're well, well represented across both larger institutions uh, with big programs as well as the HBCUs and we feel really good about that. But yeah, that program, uh, both on the driver side and the pickle development side, is really just designed to give people opportunities, right? Um, that who, who would necessarily have those. Uh, the driver portion is a little bit different, obviously, in how it, because, you know, the um, how you become a driver is, is a lot more complicated, a little bit less straightforward. Than it is to be a pick crew member. If you can, if you can curl tires and sling tires around and pick up a gas can and you can move quick, you can, you're, you know, you got a good chance to get in and be a pick crew member as well. Driving side is a little bit different. There's a lot of different paths you can take in terms of carding, bandolero, quarter midgets, et cetera, and so forth. So identifying that talent uh, sometimes is a little bit more challenging, but um, we certainly, you know, feel really proud about, you know, like you said, the Bubba Wallace of the world. Um, and some other things. Suarez, who's also in the Cup Series, about um, some of the younger drivers that we have in the program now. Roger Carruth is a um, young black kid out in Washington D.C. Uh, Perry Patino, who's from uh, from Alabama. Gracie Trotter. So it's, it's it's a long list of, of talented folks that are that are coming through. Um, and like any sport, everyone doesn't succeed in there. It's it's a, it's about filling the pipeline and making sure that we've got people who have the opportunities, and it's on them to take advantage of that and move up the ranks. I think that's what's so ironic about that. You, you've heard about, I'm sure you've heard about, you know, the initiative to bring more of the top talent um, back to HBCUs. And when they say, when they mention top talent, usually they're talking about basketball and football. No one would equate NASCAR with HBCUs. So I think I'm glad that you highlighted that and, and just talked about the many various people or various HBCU graduates that are working with NASCAR that actually have a job and that are going over the wall with NASCAR because that's something that unless you go to this pit crew combine, you have no idea. So yeah. I think that's one of the things, um, you know, of course, Alvin Kamara came out. There's a lot more of our demographic. I wouldn't even just say African Americans, but our demographic in our age, that people that are just like, okay, you know, NASCAR might be kind of cool outside of wearing the, the, you know, the NASCAR jackets that were cool back in the day, a couple years ago, <laughs> but you're getting people that actually want to come out to the track. Do you think that's something that's going to be sustained or you think that's kind of a, just, you know, the excite? do you think the ex excitement around NASCAR is something that will be sustained or do you think it's just kind of, when I say, I don't want to say trendy because it's, it's, an, unfor it's an, an unfortunate situation that happened with George Floyd and, and, but, but on the positive side of it, you've seen a whole lot of companies rethink their diversity practices and, and show a little bit more empathy, I want to say, to the African-American community. But do you think that this is something that as the time goes on, that African-Americans interest in NASCAR is going to is going to kind of die off, too? So in terms of the in terms of the fans continuing to, to, to come to the racetrack, uh, I, I think that that's on us primarily. Right. It's what are we doing in order to I won't be talking to you many more times on the platform, right? Because I'll be gone. And so, um, and, and I can say that with sincerity because I know that the company is, is, is serious about it and they, you know, they want to make this work. So I think part of that is on us. I think the other part of it is, is I think our, our racing product is compelling enough that we'll keep people coming back. The things around the racetrack, I think, are compelling enough. Again, if we talk about the tailgates and just all the sights and sounds and uh, that, that type of thing that goes on at the track is enough to sustain that how we communicate, how we get that word out, how we get that message out, how we make people feel when they get to the track. It's certainly mm -hmm. yeah, in our lap in this department is something we have to do. How important is Bubba Wallace and the fact that people can see themselves in the driver, uh, kind of like, I, and I'd spoken to Bubba about this before, kind of how 
golf became popular because everybody saw themselves in Tiger Woods. How important, how important has Bubba Wallace been to this movement and kind of this, this surge of popularity uh, of NASCAR within our community? It's been huge. So look, I think we have seen Bubba grow up and become a leader in our sport. Mm -hmm. um, it's unique for me, candidly, because I saw him do the same thing in terms of his talent and just driving a race car while I was at, at Rev. Um, but now to be on the opposite side of that and to see him become an activist, basically, right, and someone who's using their voice and, and becoming a leader within the garage, specifically as it relates to diversity and inclusion and, so, and social justice issues, um, something that's really, you know, I feel like I have a unique perspective on that because I've seen it both from the talent aspect and then now from, you know, from someone kind of going from a, um, what they call it, coming, coming of age uh, type story and situation. But um, so to answer your question, simply, yes, it's, it's been huge. And uh, the other way I think it's been affected is that it's empowered a driver like Roger Carew, uh, who's young and looks, looks up to all right, and, and they've developed a pretty good relationship uh, racing legend cars out there in Charlotte Motor Speedway uh, through some shootout, some of the things that they have going on. But immediately, as soon as Bubba began to speak out about these issues, Roger goes and creates uh, an iRacing platform and an iRacing race, the George Floyd uh, Memorial that he put on. And so you saw him start to take a bigger step as well. And so I think uh, in his own way, he kind of created his own pipeline and, and, and left a legacy for, for Roger. I think is uh, so, something that doesn't get a lot of uh, a lot of attention and talk. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, not insignificant. Well, Brandon, we we're not going to ask you for any details, of course, because I know this is still an ongoing NASCAR NASCAR investigation. Of course, the elephant in the room is what happened with Bubba at Talladega. This was in your first couple weeks in the role, so just can you talk about just from your perspective how busy you were and just how you kind of navigated through that? Like, I mean. It was literally like you hit the ground running. As soon as you were in the role, you just everything came at once. How how have you handled that? Man, it was way too lit, way too quick. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was just like, hey, VP. <laughs> it was instant. Not the way we would have liked to have started out, but of look, course, it played out. Glad that it worked out the way it did in the sense that. It, not something you know that was deemed to be uh, aimed at aimed at bubble, but yeah, it's been it's been wow. I mean, to be honest with you, just from the I mean, you were joking about the celebrity status and everything like that. I don't I don't believe that it's a celebrity situation. However, uh, <laughs> I want to be clear <laughs> where this thing went in terms of you know um, the Twitter support, the outreach. You know, it, I mean, the support candidly from the industry has been a little bit overwhelming. You know, people are. You know, reaching out and congratulating me, and uh, you know, really offering their support, which I think is the most uh, the most significant part of all this. Because look, I I can't, I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. I, my team is not going to be able to do this on our own, right? We're going to need not only in terms of all the departments across NASCAR um, and the racetracks and that, but we're going to need support from the fans, we're going to need support from the teams, we're going to need support from the drivers. Um, so across the board, we're going to need we're going to need that, and so. That's the part, to be honest with you, that's been the most overwhelming is just seeing how many people, I think, felt empowered by us taking the steps that we did. Because, you know, obviously people are talking about the Confederate flag for good reason, and that was a huge step for us. But, you know, coming out supporting Pride Month, you know, I think was also something that was significant. Having Bubba obviously run a Black Lives Matter um, you know, paint scheme there at Martinsville, very significant. So uh, a lot of things, um, even before t uh, Talladega, uh, that will come along, but just the outpouring of support is, is the main thing that I point back to. Like I haven't even opened Facebook to be honest with y'all. Like I, I, I feel like I don't even want to. Just cause I'm, I feel like it'd be too daunting of a task. Like, <laughs> everybody, thank you. I think I'm just for one blanket message. Thank you for your support, and I might have to shut it down. So it's been, uh, it's been good. Yeah, what? we look. We're appreciative that you came to do our interview because we know that you know like you said you guys were shut down for a while but we were trying to actually get you on the week of your appointment but then everything just took off you had to get ready for racing because you're still are you done transitioning into your new role or are you still doing some race operation stuff very little so the the design for oh. the beginning is that it, it's all in but obviously as, as corporate transitions go you know uh, a lot of things have to be set up and so i'm still 
Uh, actually, today was supposed to be the official um, end of, uh, of that, but it, you know, you can make goals from football football next week, which is fine. But at this point, I would say I'm 90 10. Uh, that group over there on the uh, touring and ARCA side, uh, they know what they're doing. We've got some good people over there. So you're kind of able to just kind of check in and make sure that uh, they're not getting too far off the of path. But they, like I said, it's a good team uh, that we were able to assemble over there as well. So they're off and running. Uh, actually, the West Series is running out in uh, just outside of uh, LA, in California, at Irwindale Speedway. Um, Tracy Ellis Ross and a couple other folks have done some photo shoots out there. So it's, that's a place that I'm looking at. Uh, even for some of the stuff on this side, right, to be able to try to weave some of that uh, culture and stuff in. They do a lot of commercials out there. I think um, Fast and the Furious have done some some stunt jumps and things like that out there at their racetrack. So they, uh, they're they're very entrenched in, in the community uh, out there in terms of Hollywood and entertainment. So it, it, it'll be good to see what we may be able to uh, weave in with them on this side of the street. That kind of ties into what I was going to ask you. You said that it's really up to you guys to make sure to keep this momentum going. So what is next? What is next for, for NASCAR? And how are you guys going to make sure that this just isn't, you know, a phase during this, during these times and, and, and NASCAR really becomes something that, that, that the culture pays attention to. Yeah, I think so. One of the things that we have to do when we're, we're doing a lot of research and things like that um, on this now is what can we do at a grassroots level to really be involved? Right, and in, in, in the communities that we, you know, that where we put on races. And again, you know, I think when we look back prior to September, October last year, when the merger was from IAC, it was okay. So we've got corporate offices in Daytona, we've got corporate offices in Charlotte, we've got corporate offices in LA, corporate offices in New York. What can we do in those areas? Well, now we've expanded that, and we've got like 10 plus racetracks that we can add to that. So, you know, there's Watkins Glen, New York, there's Daytona, there's Talladega, which is just outside Atlanta, which is also just outside Birmingham. So there's some, um, and a lot of other markets across the country. And it's getting involved in the communities, in those things, and, and really lending our voice uh, as, a, as an industry. So not just NASCAR, but you know, the drivers who are at Bubba and not, you know, Ty Dillon and some of these other folks who have spoken out, Jimmy Harper. So when this kind of goes on, but it's actually doing the work in the communities, I think the first step. And then I think it's, you know, all of that has to play and tie into even what we're doing internally, um, you know, our, making sure our employees feel as welcome and inclusive as, as, as they can, right? And, and that we're building that environment around them. Because at the end of the day, those are folks that you all interact with and stuff like that. Those are the people who you're gonna, you're gonna have to rely on to make fans out of people when they go back home. Right, they speak to the environment, being welcoming. Then they can't expect anyone else in their family or their friends group to do the same. So we've got to we've got to tie that in as well, and making sure that we we're creating ambassadors out of our employees and creating a good working environment for them here. And then beyond that, we've got to get some. We have to make the all those things go into making the public believe that we truly are diverse and inclusive. And that's where you things like the flag and, and making sure that when people get to the racetrack, that they're being treated the right, they're being welcomed. So it really educated on the sport, right? Because I think that most people, NASCAR is cool. It's like a lot of stuff going on. It's like it, but it's tough to understand. I mean, I know I can speak to that from soccer, right? It's like you know when it kind of hit stuff and stuff like that. I'm like, this is exciting. And people got the little horns, the boo boo or whatever. But I don't know what's going on? <laughs> I to educate, you know, uh, the fans around what what's going on. So a lot of work to do. In, in long story short. <laughs> well, I will. I mean, you pretty much. I, ask people what questions they wanted, you know, to what was the most, I guess, burning questions that they had, of course. Um, you've, you've answered some of those, you know, people wanted to know what the next steps were and how NASCAR could make this a movement and not a moment. Um, and you talked about creating the culture and changing the culture internally, as well as, as externally. One of the questions was looking at the history of barstool sports with their insensitive comments or actions against various communities, does NASCAR think that this partnership is still in its best interest of the sport and welcoming in a welcoming place for all fans? You mentioned, you know, um, that of course, the banning of the flag. You mentioned the statement for Pride Month. Um, is that something that if you have you guys do have a lot of sponsors and, and partnerships that haven't necessarily been that welcoming to other communities? Is that something that is going to have to change as well? 
Yeah, I do believe it. I do believe it is. We're gonna have to look at and I'll tell you the truth, fast time seeing this is it's it's mutual between all of our partners, right? And so we've been, you know, we've been tapped and we've been having conversations with our partners who are holding us accountable as well. And so I think that's a two-way street, and that's exactly the way it should be, right? Like we should be holding our partners accountable. Our partners on the other side should be holding us accountable. And so that's certainly something that we're gonna be doing, and it's certainly something that we're going to ask of our partners is to help keep the checks and balances. You know, how can we partner to do things um, in order to get the desired result that we all want? Because we're all trying to serve, you know, the same community. Some of our customers are the same. When you look at a lot of, a lot of our sponsors, Coca-Cola, Geico, Comcast, Xfinity, you know, all of those types of folks, we're all trying to get to the same place. And um, it's important to them and it's important to us. And I think we've, we've, we've shown that, and that, you know, candidly has been important to us for a while, but we've got to got to keep doing it. And it's, And at the end of the day, we can sit here and I can talk about it all day long, right? But it's until we put action behind that. And again, we, we understand that. I personally understand that. And so um, I'm holding myself accountable and I, I'm sure you all will hold me. Yeah. <laughs> so we know you got to get out of here quick. One last question for you specifically, not even really related to NASCAR. Well, I guess it is related to NASCAR. How is your Clark Atlanta, how has Clark Atlanta assisted with your growth within a corporate environment such as NASCAR? And when are you going to be vegan? When am I going to be vegan? That's what they, I mean, I don't know. Did you, is, did you make a pledge to go towards veganism? It's kind of a random question, but how has Clark Atlanta, you know, prepared you for your, your corporate climb within NASCAR? And um, yeah, Michael, somebody named Michael Jordan on Twitter wants to know when you're going to be vegan. That's funny. So uh, I'll take the first the first part of that question first. Um, <laughs> basic level, right? They provided me the, the resources in terms of the professors and counselors and things like that to curate opportunities for internships, which is how I ended up at the National Super Speedway. So that's on a, a very basic level. But um, I'm a business administration and marketing uh, person by trade. So uh, Clark Atlanta Business School is, is certainly up there, uh, certainly amongst the HBCUs, but even amongst all HBCUs. Uh, for, uh, for the things that they produce and the graduates that they produce. And so, you know, just the, the, the rigor of the, of the curriculum and kind of how they prepare you. What I loved about it was that it wasn't just about the textbooks. There were a lot of people, I can think about a lot of my professors that um, really pushed us on projects to think outside of uh, the norm, right, and the easy things. So I think back one uh, one particular of my professors in a marketing and promotions class, it was like, you know, of course, all, the only thing we wanted to do was just give free stuff away, just give free stuff away. <laughs> like, listen, as of today, like, you can't say that anymore, right? So it's about thinking about different ways to collaborate, cross-promote, do all those sorts of other things. So, you know, taking it out of the textbooks and really making it practical. Um, as to the vegan question, that's random. So I don't know, uh, I've been, I have classified this as flirting with veganism and vegetarianism uh, really since, Thanksgiving. I'll tell a brief story. Uh, sitting in we had an Airbnb in Nashville for Thanksgiving, a bunch of family was supposed to come over. Wake up, my cousin's watching um, one of those documentaries on Netflix, and I forget the name of it. I think it was Game Changers. One of those things that make you not want to ever eat meat again. And so. <laughs> And they're sitting there watching this, and I said, I'm like, why are y'all watching this on Thanksgiving morning? Like, <laughs> and uh, I kept trying to walk out the room so I wouldn't have to see this, right? And then eventually, end up it, it drew me in. I sat down on the couch and before I knew it, I watched the entire documentary. And so I said, okay, I'll start tomorrow. So, <laughs> wow, not today. It's gonna have to wait. <laughs> trying to jump in. So, um. I'm still struggling with that. I'm, and I've, I've tried, I've done the, the Beyond Burgers and the Beyond Sausage, I've tried it all. And it's actually not as bad as I thought that it would be. Um, I was really, I was really, I kind of, I guess at the top of the year, uh, I went, kind of went all in and for a while, you know, really tried to avoid that sort of stuff, you know, in terms of meat and stuff like that. Quarantine set me back, can't lie. Um, kind of hard, you know, you run out of options, you try to cook in, you know, it gets, you know, it's, it, it's quick and easy, right? And trying to figure that out. But uh, I don't, so the answer to that question is I don't know. I'm flirting with it and um, we'll see how long it lasts and how, and how far it goes. Did you have, you have another question? No, I'm good. 
So Brandon, again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, you know, to come in and chop it up with Vashti and I on Quick Blitz. We just felt like you were the best person to give us a clear cut portrayal of what exactly is going on in NASCAR as it pertains to us. And I say us, I mean black people. I'm just keeping it real. But um, congratulations. I mean, I told you like probably a million times, but I'm really proud of you. That's kind of, that's really dope. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the time to be able to sit with y'all. It's, it's been a it's been a journey uh, for sure, and happy you know, happy to be here. And I think it's just uh, the sky's the limit. I'm really excited. Um, you know, certainly got to have to continue to make time. You know, we joke about it, but making time for for you all who are committed to covering the sport and being you know what I what I would call fair and balanced. Like you don't you don't apologize for you know some of our shortcomings over the past, but you are also fair about the strides and efforts that we've been making. So that means a lot. So uh, anytime y'all want to uh, come out and continue to cover, we want to make that obviously not just for you all, but for any other um, media, particularly minority media, who want to come out. So it's really important that we uh, speak on these platforms. I appreciate y'all having. Me. All right. Guys, guys. Okay. I'm sorry, B. No, go ahead. I just want to make sure everybody knows that you can find our podcast on. Spotify, SoundCloud, and iTunes. Make sure, make sure you are subscribing so that you'll see when a new episode drops. Make sure you're sharing it because, you know, we're just trying to tell the stories that are often buried under everything else and giving a voice to our people and some of, some of the concerns and things of our community. So um, make sure you guys are following me, Sheena underscore Marie 3 on Twitter and Instagram, Vashti. At keep, blitzing, at keep blitzing at keep blitzing or <laughs> carolina blitz on instagram so and guys make sure you guys give me thompson a follow he talks about the funniest stuff on there he's, he's a hilarious I'm definitely gonna have follower. to follow him on twitter he is hilarious What's so we're gonna twitter? we're gonna be watching for this watching on this this um road to veganism brandon yeah, there's no hope to do that now. I'm like, I'm swerving on that road. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> she, put you, she put you on blast that you weren't even expecting it. I wasn't. Like, <laughs> I wasn't. I looked at the, oh, I said, okay, Clark Atlanta, okay, that's a good question. And when are you going to be vegan? That's why I thought maybe I missed something. Maybe you said something on your timeline. Or something. I didn't know. But no, not on Twitter. I don't think so. I did have a veggie plate for merch today, though. So that was, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, you're famous and all now, so um, <laughs> guys, we're gonna wrap up. Ep we're, I'm sorry, were you saying something? So they still charge me. Right. Well, guys, we're wrapping up episode two of Quick Blitz. Make sure you guys are tuning in. And until next time, I'm Sheena Quick. Dash Ty Hurt. And Brandon's not gonna say his name, but that's Brandon Thompson, <laughs> <laughs> NASCAR's VP of Diversity and Inclusion. Guys, until next time, see ya.